Hi. Hi, I'm Reggie McGee. Welcome to my 2022 presentation for the Merida English Library on the Mexican Revolution. Before I begin, I want to urge you to support the library and the many important programs such as this one that the library creates and sustains. And you can do that by making a contribution or by joining the library on their website. Uh, just a few quick uh, notes about this presentation. Uh, you'll be able to um, activate it uh, once I'm done by clicking on the slide that's in the present window in front of you. One click is all you need uh, because you cannot go backwards. Once you're on the next slide, you need to just click one time on that slide and the sound that accompanies that slide will begin. When you feel a pause, a long pause uh, of sound, that means that the sound is over. You can click again to the next slide, click on that slide, and you'll have the sound for that slide. Uh, the end of the video is when you see my name, my uh, e email address, and my phone number, and you can contact me with any questions that you may have, and I'll be glad to answer them. Um, just another note, uh, this begins the Mexican Revolution in 1914. I've done previous episodes for you. One of them is on the website. At this particular point, the revolution has advanced from the 1911 uh, revolt that was loosely organized by a large group of um, anti-reelection um, activists all over um, Mexico who were opposed to the 34-year uh, rule of Porfirio Diaz, General Porfirio Diaz, who essentially took over after Benito Juarez. Um, his 34-year rule uh, became known as a Porfiriato. It was, uh, in the end, very despotic uh, and uh, essentially uh, focused all the attention on the small number of upper class, uh, both uh, Mexican and foreign, who ended up owning most of the uh, large uh, landed property and natural resources and uh, had shut everybody out. Uh, that period ended up being uh, led by another large landowner, uh, a bit more liberal, Francisco Madero, who along with uh, Pancho Villa, Emiliano Zapata, Pascal, Pascual Orozco, and even um, uh, forces aligned with Carranza, um, Venestiano Carranza, uh, all over the country created a movement that after um, the revolt by Madero, as well as um, uh, the Flores brothers with the Partido Liberal Mexicano, um, were able to essentially defeat uh, the federal army in a few key battles and uh, force Porfirio Diaz out of office. Madero took over, was in office for about a year, was unwilling and unable to settle the issue of land reform, uh, particularly as was being um, fought out in Morelos, or the state of Morelos, south of the capital, and in adjo adjoining states by Emiliano Zapata and the Z Zapatista movement. He was unable to uh, grant them any uh, land reform and uh, essentially wanted them to disarm. And when they didn't, he attacked them with the federal army. Uh, they were unable to defeat the Zapatistas. And there was uh, a great deal of uh, discontent among the uh, wealthy foreigners and the wealthy Mexicanos, uh, which ultimately led to a uh, military coup that was organized uh, partially by a very uh, racist and uh, rabbit um, uh, crazy person, a U.S. ambassador, um, Henry Lane Wilson, along with General uh, Victoriano Huerta. Uh, that occurred in February of 1913. Um, a group, a large coalition, uh, formed in opposition to the Huerta coup. Those people included uh, Emiliano Zapata and his movement. Uh, by then, Pancho Villa, who had been arrested during the Madero period by Huerta, came back into the country and organized an army, which became known as the Division of the North. And uh, there were others. Uh, they ended up defeating uh, General Huerta, and that was the point uh, in which this presentation takes place. So I uh, welcome you to view it. I hope that you enjoy it. And um, thank you for attending. <laughs> uh, 
There were four major forces prevailing in Mexico following the defeat of General Victoriano Huerta in August 1914. Perhaps the most powerful were the forces around Pancho Villa and his army, the Division of the North. A second powerful group were the forces around the self-declared First Chief, Venustiano Carranza, including the politically astute and ambitious General Álvaro Obregón. Carranza was the most conservative of all the leaders at the time. He was a landowner and a former governor of the state of Coahuila under Porfirio oh, Diaz. Yeah, but I was Emiliano Zapata and the Zapatista movement were a peasant force, located well, principally in the state of Morelos and several nearby states. And finally, the slowly organizing and potentially powerful Mexican working class, located in the centers of industrialization, whose center of power was the Casa de Obreros in Mexico City. With Pancho Villa's decisive defeat of General Huerta's federal forces in the battles in Torreón twice, Ciudad Juárez, Saltillo, and Zacatecas, the Division of the North had become the country's most powerful and mobile military force. Not only did Villa and his army control the center of the country, they also controlled the north to south rail lines running through the center to the U.S. border in Texas. Most importantly, with the capture of the rail hub at Torreon, they gained a huge weapons dump and an immense militarized rail transport system. From that point on, Villa's forces would travel long distances by train with their cavalry, artillery, and mobile field hospitals. At that time, rail was the most advanced form of transportation. The Zapatistas, on the other hand, remained a southern force, centered in the state of Morelos, south of Mexico City, and including the nearby states of Puebla and Guerrero. They were a guerrilla army, decentralized, and led by many local commanders. They had no consistent rail transport, lived off the land, and were militarily supplied by weapons and ammunition that they'd captured from the Federal Army. A peasant-based force, they were at home in their regions and enjoyed significant support from the peasant villages that were their base. The First Chief's Army of the Northeast and Northwest, while large, well-armed, and organized, were caught in a military limbo surrounded by their rivals. However, they gained an advantage following the defeat of Huerta by being the first to occupy the nation's capital. Carranza and his generals had a view of becoming a national power. Neither of their opponents viewed the situation similarly. In this photo, we see Carranza entering the capital. He is flanked on the left by General Álvaro Obregón and on the right by General Pablo González. The first chief, however, was ready to move. After arriving in Mexico City in August 1914, he functioned under the Plan de Guadalupe that he had issued in 1913 in response to the Huerta coup. Under this plan, functioning as interim president, he would appoint the government ministers, schedule elections, and call for a constitutional convention to replace the 1857 Constitution. This plan was essentially a return to the old Madero order that aligned with Carranza's politically conservative views. Serious land reform and improvements for working people were not among Carranza's priorities. That's when the newly politicized military of Carranza and Villa took charge. 
The now left-leaning generals and officers press Carranza not to hold a constitutional convention, to which many of them would not be selected to take part. Instead, they pressed for a military convention that would take charge and determine the direction of the revolution. After all, they thought, who has done all the fighting? Who has the real power? They were right. And with a victorious Pancho Villa pressing Carranza to put land reform on the table, as had been agreed to in the Pacte de Torreon between Villa and Carranza, after Villa had decisively defeated the federal army, Carranza was forced to give in. Carranza scheduled the now famous military convention in Aguas Calientes for October 10th. Meanwhile, the workers in Mexico City were beginning to move. Under the Madero government in 1912 and the Huerta government in early 1913, labor syndicates were allowed to form. The anarcho-syndicalist leadership of these early unions steered away from politics and their philosophical views, and the unions were largely silent about the Huerta military coup. In Mexico City, the unions came together in a loosely knit confederation known as the Casa de Obreros Mundial, or COM. As the syndicates began to grow, they held demonstrations and limited strikes. Unions were organized in other parts of the country, and on May 13, 1913, the Mexico City Casa de Obreros held the first large and peaceful May Day celebration. However, in early 1914, with General Huerta still in charge, another May Day rally was held. This time, the syndicates denounced the military dictatorship and appealed for a return to democracy. This was too much for General Huerta, and he had the strike leaders arrested and repressed union activities. Labor was set back, but continued with mass meetings and speeches, education and unionizing efforts. After Huerta was defeated, the syndicates reemerged, and locals were formed in many individual workplaces, largely non-industrial, and they were associated with the Casa de Obreros. Unfortunately, neither Villa or Zapata's views encompassed allying with workers as a political or military force. Neither did Carranza's, but Obregón's did. In the brief time that the Carranza forces were in Mexico City, General Obergon reached out to the leaders of La Casa. He made contacts that would be very important when he returned to Mexico City a year later. When the military convention opened in Aguas Calientes, Villa demanded that land reform be focused on, and it was agreed to. The convention also sent emissaries to Zapata and invited his participation. This rare photo shows Pancho Villa at the military convention. To his left is General Ilalio Gutierrez, who would later play a very important role. Between the two is the Mexican flag, which all generals and delegates to the convention signed, as a show of their loyalty and commitment to the ideals of the revolution. Although invited, Emiliano Zapata declined to attend, but sent a delegation. This group included Manuel Palafox, his chief of staff and advisor, and Antonio Soto Igama. The group also included Zapatista military commanders and fighters. Here we see a photo of many of the Zapatista delegates. Antonio Soto Igama had been part of the San Luis Potosi intellectuals group, whose early efforts founded the anti-reelection movement that led to Francisco Madero's 1910 call for revolt against President Diaz. Soto Igama was also an early collaborator of Ricardo Flores Magón and the PLM, the Partido Liberal Mexicano, the first revolutionary party of the Mexican Revolution. Antonio Soto Igama had been fighting for reform and revolution since the early 1900s, and it was amazing that he had survived this long, especially since when he was asked to speak on behalf of the Zapatistas at the convention, he grabbed the flag and denounced all who had signed it as not being committed to action. He was nearly shot on the spot. 
The presence of the Zapatista delegates moved the convention to approve Zapata's Plan de Ayala as the foundation for land reform. That radical plan involved locally supervised land expropriation without compensation from wealthy landowners, Mexican or foreign. Carranza was completely opposed to that plan and the idea of expropriation. It's my view that expropriation without compensation was the dividing line between the revolutionary forces. The Plan de Ayala was issued by Emiliano Zapata and 38 Zapatista chiefs in November 1911, defining their opposition to the demand by the new Madero government to cease their efforts at fundamental land reform. Drafted by Zapata and his friend and former school teacher, Otilio Montano, the program had several crucial elements, including the revolutionary concept that the people, not the state, had the right to expropriate property without compensation and to defend that seizure with arms. The plan broke with and denounced President Madero as, number one, a false man, a betrayer of the principles of the revolution, since Madero had sought to disarm the Zapatistas and then to attack them militarily with the federal army. Number two, it declared that the field, timber, and water that had been seized from those communities with title would be immediately returned and that the people would enforce that with arms. Number three, it declared that one-third of the properties of the landowners that had taken land should be returned to the pueblos and the people. And number four, that those landlords, wealthy and rich, who opposed the plan would have all of their properties expropriated, two-thirds of which would go to widows, orphans, or war victims. And so, after weeks of discussion and wrangling, the convention decided not to invest the presidency in Carranza, but instead choose one of their own, a left-leaning general, Ulalio Gutierrez. Villa and Carranza were also asked to resign their commands. In this photo, Gutierrez is shown on the left. The first chief would not agree, and this led to his decisive and public break with the convention. Carranza and his forces immediately decamped from Mexico City to their new capital in Orizaba and Veracruz City. Obregón and a host of officers loyal to Carranza quickly followed. That left control of the convention and, in effect, the government in the hands of Pancho Villa. President Gutierrez appointed Pancho Villa to head the conventionalist army and Villa quickly moved to occupy Mexico City. He was soon joined by Zapata. In this picture we see the two and their armies entering Mexico City in December 1914. For a few short days in early December 1914, the two leaders were finally together for the first and last times. A few pictures captured this high moment of the revolution when the leaders of the peasants and a section of the working class occupied the seats of power. Their occupation of Mexico City was temporary, as was their hold and aspiration for national power. Both were eager to return to their regions and neither wanted national governing power. They both departed Mexico City within days leaving it to the conventionalist government under General Gutierrez. Gutierrez would keep it for about two weeks, then depart for Carranza's camp. His main achievement would be to sabotage Emiliano Zapata's effort to attain trains and arms to attack General Obregón in nearby Puebla as he was retreating to Veracruz. Unknown at that time, Gutierrez's actions would seriously impact the outcome of the revolution. Mexican historian and one-time political prisoner Adolfo Guile sums that moment up this way. A turning point appears in the course of every popular revolution. If the radical wing does not then grasp political power, the movement inevitably begins to fall back, though never to square one. The disintegration is not at once apparent, because furious battles continue to dominate the arena. But even if the leadership does not perceive 
that the critical point has passed. Its insecure allies, the ranks and leadership of the intermediate classes, attracted in the period of rising movement, never fail to register the ebb and are always the first to desert. That pretty much sums up the flight of General Gutierrez and other generals who went to the side of Carranza. And about the entire revolutionary period that crested in December 1914 before tumbling into 1915, Geely had this to say. Before they entered fresh battles, all opposing factions of the revolution had to recognize principles which, though not sanctioning the definite victory of the revolution, essentially proclaimed the irreversible triumph of its initial objectives. All this should be added to the historical balance sheet of the Northern Division, the Southern Liberation Army, and that high point of Mexican history, the occupation of the capital by the peasant armies. However, Mexico City at the start of 1915 was in deep trouble. Inflation and shortages of all resources were the order of the day. The city was awash in rubble, and there were lines everywhere for even the most basic goods. Widespread unemployment and starvation crushed the vast majority of the residents. All of the revolutionary forces had left the capital, and crime was high. The Gutierrez government had been powerless to address any of the real problems of the city and the nation, especially since over half of the most talented and committed revolutionary leaders had left the city, following Carranza and Obregón, to begin waging war on the other half. Meanwhile, south of the capital, in the state of Morelos, the Zapatistas were engaged in their own program of land reform. Seizure of land from large landowners, Mexican and foreign, and redistribution to armed village communities and local militias. Yet while it appeared at this time that Villa and Zapata had the largest armies and held the most cards, Carranza and Obregón still had cards to play. On November 23, 1914, American troops withdrew from the port of Veracruz that they had occupied in April 1914. This withdrawal created two significant advantages for Carranza and Obregón. The de facto recognition of the supposedly nationalist first chief Carranza meant that armed shipments to his forces were approved. Correspondingly, an embargo was placed on armed shipments to Villa's forces. Equally important militarily, Carranza inherited a huge arms depot in the port. The Americans had been seizing and stockpiling arms that had been ordered for the federal forces under Huerta, and it was enormous. It was enough to equip Obregón's army with the most modern military equipment and ammunition. Significant among the type of weapons were field cannons, machine guns, and barbed wire. These particular elements of war would be among the key weaponry used to confront Pancho Villa's powerful division of the North. At the end of January 1915, following the split and breakup of the convention, General Obregón briefly reoccupied Mexico City. At that moment, another significant turning point occurred. General Obregón spent a large part of his time in meetings with the Casa de Obrero's leadership and he was successful in convincing a significant part of that leadership that he was in support of unions and labor rights. He provided them with food in the midst of dire food shortages, printing presses, and meeting spaces. In return, Obregón was able to recruit about 10,000 workers, enough to form six red battalions. These politicized workers were sent east to Orizaba and Veracruz, where they were armed, trained, and then transported back across the country to reinforce Obregón's army as it confronted the division of the north in the pivotal battles at this stage of the revolution in the center of the country. Neither Villa or Zapata had included any organized workers in their plans. 
Zapata had recruited agricultural workers among his forces in relatively small numbers and as individuals. Villa had large numbers of workers in his armies, yet they functioned as individuals and were in various fighting units. Villa always insisted on improving workers' lives in his plans, but made no specific outreach to the growing syndicates. Obergon did understand, and paid specific attention to their demands and needs. As a result, he gained a significant fighting force just when he needed it. Both Villa and Zapata were good open field fighters, with significant grassroots support. But they had limited political vision, and only Zapata's land reform program to present to recruits. Historian Stuart Easterling makes a metaphor, viewing Zapata's forces as a team that plays exceedingly well at home, but not as well on the road. Using the same metaphor, in my opinion, Villa commanded a successful team that played well at home or on the road. Pancho Villa was a wily fighter who once used creative tactics to outsmart the old school Federal Army. But in the pivotal battles in central Mexico in 1915, Villa was largely committed to one basic tactic, direct forward charges, right into the middle of the opposing forces. It had won for him before against Huerta's Federales, but Obergon had beaten Huerta as well. Pancho Villa's astute, militarily educated advisor and former federal general Felipe Angeles, who was in charge of the artillery, advised Villa at the breakup of the convention to quickly pursue and defeat Carranza in Veracruz with the help of Zapata attacking from the south. Villa and Angeles debated the strategy. But in the end, Villa decided not to head east to attack Obergon, but to turn west toward his stronghold in Chihuahua. History might have changed had Villa decided to attack Obergon much earlier, but at that moment, Villa was more interested in fighting near home. To bolster their war efforts and to exert their control over more of the country, Carranza and Obergon sent three of their most radical generals south. General Francisco Mujica was sent to control Tabasco. General Salvador Alvarado was sent to control the Hennequin riches in the Yucatan. And General Jesus Agustin Castro, seen here in the center, was sent to control Chiapas. Once in place, these radical generals abolished debt peonage and company stores reducing the power of the rich landowners, the hated hacendados. They created public works, opened schools, and encouraged unions and peasant organizations. They also enacted limited land distribution. Here we see General Mujica distributing land in Tabasco. In the Yucatan, with its incredible riches in Hennequin production, and in the oil-rich region of Tabasco, the Carranza forces gained a steady stream of cash to finance their war efforts against Villa and Zapata. Buoyed it by the rearmament of his forces, the addition of the newly formed Red Battalions, the officers who went with Carranza after the convention, and the incorporation of the Yaqui Indians of Sonora, on March 9, 1915, General Obergon took the train westward to confront Pancho Villa and the Northern Division. The Yaqui Indians of Sonora have one of the saddest stories of the revolution. They had been fighting against seizure of their land since the 1880s and had become fierce warriors. During these intense desert wars, they had fought against the federal troops of Presidents Diaz, Madero, and Huerta. Those that were captured, along with entire families, were sent to labor and die on the Hennequin plantations in the Yucatan, far from their homes. Growing up in Sonora, Obergon had learned their language and had used them in various of his armies during the revolution. They would serve him well again in the battle against Villa and the Northern Division. 
But when Obregón later became president, he would give them nothing. Yet rather than continuously attack and harass Obregón as he approached from the east, drawing him increasingly further from his supply lines through Puebla and Veracruz, Villa decided to sit tight and confront him in the flatlands near Guanajuato. While this might have been an advantage to Villa's powerful cavalry, it allowed Obregón to dig in and built highly deadly fronts of trenches, barbed wire, machine gun emplacements, and artillery support, tactics straight from the European battlefields of World War I that Obergon had meticulously studied. At that point, it appeared that Villa still had the upper hand. Obergon commanded about 15,000 troops, including 6,000 cavalry. It was estimated that Villa commanded 22,000 troops with an equal number or greater number of cavalry. Both had strong artillery units. The serious fighting began in April. In a series of bloody battles around Celaya and Leon, in the state of Guanajuato, Villa's infantry and cavalry made countless heroic charges. Yet they were ultimately turned back by the barbed wire, trenches, and machine guns of Obregón. On this map, you'll see Mexico City on the lower right, the rail lines leading north to Carretero and Guanajuato, and the battlefields with Celaya and Leon, number two, and Villa's retreat north to Aguascalientes, number three. Both sides were reinforced and fighting raged for days, but Villa had suffered tremendous losses in his direct forward charges. He retreated north toward Aguas Calientes, where again he faced off against Obregón. Again, Villa was defeated, losing a great deal of his army and his armaments. By July 10, it was all over. Pancho Villa was defeated, and the once all-powerful division of the north was shattered and destroyed. In the heat of the battles, Obregón was seriously wounded. Coming within hours of death, he miraculously escaped, losing only his arm, not his life. Amazingly, within just two years, all of the hard work, organizing, and fighting that Pancho Villa had done to develop this revolutionary army and himself as a revolutionary force were reversed. Villa would retreat north into the mountains of Sonora with a few thousand men and his trusted elite personal guard, the Dorados. Pancho Villa's role in the Mexican Revolution was over. In the following years, he would appear occasionally on the political stage, but only as a thorn in Obregón's side. He would never again be a general, but his essential and pivotal role in the Mexican Revolution would live forever. With Villa defeated and on the run, Carranza returned to the capital in August 1915 and assumed the presidency. But Mexico was in shambles, in a state of war and destruction since 1913, and even longer in Morelos due to the unceasing federal efforts to eliminate Zapata and his movement since 1912, much of the country was seriously damaged. By early 1916, with working people facing disastrous conditions in Mexico City and throughout the country, the syndicates went on the move. Believing that they had earned some credit for the sacrifices of the Red Battalions during the war, they increased their organizing efforts and called strikes over inflation, long hours, and a lack of stable currency. Workers were being paid in bills that had little value. They wanted payment in gold. And by this time, tens of thousands of workers in Mexico City and throughout the country had joined the syndicates. This picture is of striking workers outside of the foreign-owned telephone company in Mexico City. President Carranza quickly responded with force. First, he disarmed and disbanded the Red Battalions, depriving the workers of the armed power that they had used to win him his seat as president. 
In that action, the workers were denied a powerful ability to back up their demands. He also evicted the Casa de Obreros from their headquarters at the Jockey Club, the Casa Azules, once a hangout of the rich. That classic building had been given to La Casa by Carranza and Obregón when they were trying to win the syndicates to their cause. In this photo, we see a group of workers outside of a meeting hall near the Casa Azules. Minutes after this photo was taken, the meeting was broken up by mounted armed army forces. La Casa Azules, once the jockey club, the hangout of the rich, and then the headquarters of the Casa de Obreros Mundial, is now a Sanborns restaurant in downtown Mexico City, where once Zapatista peasants were served at the counter. Also in the summer of 1916, a large May Day celebration was held with tens of thousands of striking workers walking to Alameda Park in the center of Mexico City. Note the tall triangular hats worn by some of these demonstrating workers. Those are campaign hats worn by members of the Red Battalions. In late May of 1916, faced with disastrous economic conditions and climbing inflation, the syndicates called for the first of two pivotal general strikes. The first strike was settled when General Benjamin Hill agreed to meet with strike leaders to hear their demands. He then forced business leaders to meet with the striking syndicate leaders. The result were substantial wage increases for striking workers and improved working conditions. In this photo, General Hill is seated to the far right, and Luis Morones, a strike leader, is seated second from left. Morones would go on to lead the syndicates for many years, cementing a close and subservient relationship between labor and the ruling party. But in late July, the peso would take a dive, wiping out the gains of the first general strike. A second general strike would be called. This time, General Hill had been reassigned, and the striking workers completely shut down all power, water, and public services in the capital. This time, President Carranza invited strike leaders to the National Palace, where they were quickly arrested and charged with treason. On the third day of the strike, power was restored when the leader of the striking electrical workers was threatened with death at gunpoint by the army. Here we see striking ex-Red Battalion members outside of a meeting hall. And this time General Obergon would meet with strike leaders and advise them not only to end the strike, but to disband to avoid further arrests and repression. A second, non-arrested strike committee would discuss this and agree. Over objections from a section of the Syndicate Confederation, the majority of the strike leaders would also agree. Labor would pause activities until 1917. The second general strike was a turning point loss for labor. Historian John Mason Hart who has written a number of books about the Mexican Revolution, sums it up this way. The Constitutionalist Army, working in concert with the foreign and wealthiest owners and managers of private enterprise, broke the Casa. In doing so, they defeated the working class revolution and destroyed the independence of the industrial and urban labor movement. At this point, the Constitutionalist military were the most powerful single force in politics, and they were not under the complete control of Carranza. Many officers used this period of disorganization to enrich themselves. Others, with political ambition or ideological commitment, agitated to continue social reforms. Obergon leaned to the left at this moment, seeking to maintain his alliances with many different forces and to manage the scope of the reforms. Carranza then scheduled a constitutional convention to draft a new constitution to replace the 1857 constitution, in place since the government of Benito Juarez. But the generals would have their last say. 
In December 1916, 200 delegates met in the city of Carretero, in the center of the country. Of the 200, only three were from labor, and about the same from sympathizers of Zapata-styled land reform. Unlike the convention of 1915, a year earlier, this was not a military convention, but a radical military element, led by General Francisco Mujica, fought to include more radical social policy against the conservative Carranza faction. In the end, when the Constitution was adopted on January 11, 1917, it contained a number of historic and powerful articles. They are... Article 3, Education. The state educational system must be secular and not promote religion. It must be free of cost and promote democratic values. It must avoid giving privileges of race, creed, class, sex, or persons. Elementary education was made compulsory. Private schools were allowed, provided that they conform generally with the first two items. Religious education would be strictly regulated. Article 27 addressed land expropriation by the state for social good. It mandated the creation and protection of small-scale and communal land holdings. It also addressed the nationalization of all mineral and oil wealth by declaring that the national resources are the property of the nation. President Carranza, however, did not agree with this article and others. During his government, only 173,000 hectares were distributed to 40,000 peasants. Article 123 addressed labor reform, including the right to join unions and to strike, the eight-hour workday, a minimum daily wage, a six-day work week, double pay for overtime, equal pay for women, the creation of schools, infirmaries, and other necessary public services, and much more. Article 130 severely limited the power of the Catholic Church, made marriage a civil contract, and forbid the involvement of the Church in political and civic affairs. Mexican historian Adolfo Gili describes the 1917 Constitution like this. When it was finally approved on January 11, 1917, the Mexican Constitution was undoubtedly the most advanced in the world. It was not socialist, yet it virtually declared the big land owners and landafundia to be unconstitutional, thereby dismantling one of the former pillars of Mexican capitalism. It guaranteed the rights of workers and peasants, not just the rights of man in general. It was a nationalist document that favored nationalization reforms in the main branches of the economy. Historian of the precursor movement of intellectuals, prior to 1910, James D. Cockroft offers a more nuanced view. He states, from the innumerable conflicts between Mexico's revolutionary intellectuals, political leaders, social groups, and political coalitions between classes, from the precursor movement's formulation of the radical social economic goals of the revolution, from all of the disputes and divisions that derived from and followed the precursor pattern, from the bloodied battlefields and explosive convention halls of civil war, there finally emerged in 1917 the first clearly recognizable results of the revolution. Those results were a defeated peasantry, a crippled and dependent labor movement, a wounded but victorious bourgeoisie, and for a divided Mexican people, a paper triumph, the 1917 Constitution. That concludes the formal part of the presentation. I had mentioned that I would um, conclude by suggesting a few books for you if you are interested in following up and reading more about the revolution. Here's one of the better ones, Revolutionary Mexico by John Mason Hart. John Mason Hart has written a number of books about the Mexican Revolution, uh, analyzing various individuals and phases, and he knows what he's talking about. Several other important books that helped me to produce this 
um, presentation were John Mason Hart again, Anarchism and the Mexican Working Class. This is one of the best studies of the origins, uh, both um, force and philosophical, of the Mexican working class, as he points out, from 1660 to 1931. Uh, I would highly recommend it if you're interested in uh, following the course of the working class in the revolution. Another important book is Via and Zapata by Frank McLinn. Uh, this is a book that goes into the uh, histories and personalities of these two leaders, their interactions, and their course, the courses of their um, lives and struggles. Uh, if you're looking at those two individuals, I'd highly recommend this, Via and Zapata. And finally, these two excellent books. I've used them both in various of my presentations. The Mexican Revolution by Adolfo Gili uh, presents a left-wing approach. Uh, Gili was a political prisoner after the 1968 demonstrations in Mexico City uh, and um, a very well-studied uh, historian. He wrote this actually in prison. Uh, so if you're interested in a left-wing take on the Mexican Revolution, The Mexican Revolution by Adolfo Gili is your book. Uh, the other book that's proven most helpful, a very good overall outline of the revolution with some interesting details and facts, is the Mexican Revolution by uh, Stuart Easterling. He's one of the people that I've quoted in this particular uh, presentation. It's not a large book, but it's a very good book, and I'd recommend that as well, The Mexican Revolution by Stuart Easterling. This concludes the formal presentation, and I will be available for any questions uh, that you may have. Thank you.